makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Now, Meta and Amazon surge at cost-cutting pays off. Investors punish Apple as sales slump in China. Now, U.S. jobs days here, of course, today. Non-farm payrolls are expected to show a slower pace of hiring with revisions to past reports key to the Fed's outlook. Plus, the Bank of England opens the door to rate cuts for the first time this cycle. We'll bring you our interview with Governor Andrew Bailey. So good morning, everyone. Let's take a look at the European markets map. A lot going on in today's trading session, all about the jobs report, of course, in the U.S., but also trying to figure out exactly what we've lived through with the Fed, the Bank of England, and what that means for future rate cuts when and if they actually happen in the next couple of months. Now, a couple of things that we're also watching out for. Of course, we had a big, big week for earnings. Um, stocks at the moment rising a touch. Again, we did have some tech earnings that were lifting a lot of the mood out there before this U.S. jobs report, expected probably to show a little bit more cooling in the U.S. labor market. So we'll have a full roundup of what we're expecting with labor. But first, Meta and Amazon surging in late trading as investors rewarded the tech giants for cost-cutting efforts and refocusing their businesses. Now, Apple, on the other hand, was punished as sales slumped in China. In a moment, we'll be speaking to Janet Henry, a global chief economist at HSBC. But first, we're joined by Aggie Cantrell, our tech reporter, to discuss the earnings story. Aggie, I have like a million and one questions on a million and one companies, but what were the key takeaways from these earnings. So a key thing that we saw over the last week was essentially that some companies have been able to really pivot this year to really listen to investors when it comes to cost cutting and also when it comes to actually where they're reinvesting certain areas of their capital, especially in AI. And that's why I think Meta is a really interesting story this morning because this was really a victory lap for Meta. Last year, Mark Zuckerberg declared it as the year of efficiency all these serious cost cuts, not just in the case of jobs, but also mm -hmm. looking for efficiencies mm -hmm. in a business that a lot of people were criticizing about being quite bloated beforehand. Mm -hmm. And also, Meta is a company that not only is developing its own large language model, but also is a company that has been able to notice their immediate value add of mm -hmm. AI, especially when it comes to precisely targeting ads mm -hmm. towards their different consumer base. And so there are lots of different ways in which you can see that AI efficiencies focus on one side of the equation and also also cost cutting on the other. De Apple, on the other hand, is quite a different story, and it had lots of issues when it came to its China sales. Yeah, it certainly is. Aggie, thanks so much, as always, for a great round of there are some of the tech stories. Now, joining us now is Janet Henry, Global Chief Economist at HSBC. And I'm sure, Janet, at, at the margins, this, of course, you know, touches productivity and things like that. But you have other things to worry about. It's inflation and interest rate cuts. Is there a general sense that actually now that has been um, pushed back because central banks want to, to wait a little bit more before they actually start cutting? Yes. I mean, we know the next move is now. Um, they will be cutting interest rates. But it's been the same story from all of them, really. It's been, we need to be more confident. We need to see more evidence that inflation is coming down. Well, obviously, they're, they're delighted that we've had several months of lower than expected inflation in, in most of the, of the, the G10 um, economies. But at the moment, it's kind of, you know, what's the hurry? Yeah. You know, they can wait even before the next meeting while they've kind of pushed away from any March rate cut. And certainly we never expected a March rate cut. We've got our first rate cuts from the majors in June. Um, they know even between now and March, they've got a bit more data to come through. They haven't completely yeah. closed the door, depending on what happens in financial conditions yeah. and the inflation and the activity mm -hmm. data that will determine when they cut and then the pace of cuts. There but so, Janet, what, what are they fearing? actually and I don't know whether there's an underlying mood that actually they're worried that they have to cut and then raise if there's something happening in the inflation yep. or they're just not a hundred percent convinced that you know that the trajectory for the whole year is core inflation going down well they know there are risks on both sides if they cut prematurely and then the economy reaccelerates and inflation reaccelerates then they may actually have to reverse it and start tightening again but they are also mindful if they leave it too late and you get a much harder landing mm -hmm. and actually then undershoot their inflation targets. Remember, these are inflation targeting central banks. Yeah. They do not want <laughs> to go back to where they were in terms of undershooting um, on inflation. Yeah. So obviously they don't need to decide now how much they're yeah. actually going to cut from. The initial stage is when do they cut? And at the moment, certainly as far as the Fed is concerned, the economy is doing OK. Yes, we yeah. know it's going to slow. We will see some signs in the labour market of it starting to slow. Slow, but actually, the activity data growth has still been above trend. 
So what are you expecting from the jobs data today? Um, well, we're, we're pretty much in line with the market, <laughs> okay. but I think, you know, making all the same comments that everyone else is making. January is always an extraordinary month, yeah. and, and it was colder, it was warmer in yeah. December. We get benchmark revisions, we've got population projection revisions, so it will be one of those releases where, irrespective of what the headline is, and we've got 190,000 on payrolls, we've got a small rise in the unemployment rate, and we've got 0.3 on average earnings, but you'll get all of that usual post-rationalisation. Oh, it's the surveys, it's seasonal adjustment, and it's too soon to say. Wait for the February data. Um, but, Jack, when you look at actually the monetary lag, and this is one of, the, I, I think, probably the, the hardest thing to figure out, it takes longer than it used to. And I don't know it's because, we, you know, we haven't been used to raising rates for, for quite some time or whether it's just a reaction function. And so it, does it make it even harder to set monetary policy if it takes a lot longer also for, for the rate cuts to come through? Um, I think it, it is a very challenging world for central banks. I mean, they'll say it's never easy. But I think sometimes when financial markets are concerned, they've forgotten the extraordinary cycle we've been in for the last three or four years. Um, let's not forget, we were in trade tensions, then we had the pandemic, then we had extraordinary fiscal policy and extraordinary monetary easing, then monetary tightening. And that has impacted on different parts of the economy at different times. You know, I've talked about a rolling recession for the last two years. Um, and that's kind of what we've got over the next two years, not your typical kind of, OK, Fed's finished, yep. big rate cuts, yep. big V-shaped recovery. Actually, it's still probably going to be a bit more protracted because you've still got a lot of this stock of money that was created both by governments and by central banks that still has the capacity to impact on the profile and for some parts of the economy you will see some reacceleration even as other parts of the economy do sh slow much yeah. more materially but but also are we underestimating you know fiscal policy so we're in election year in the UK also in the US you could see inflationary pressures from tax cuts or you know the, the people in charge trying to do something to, to muster support. Yeah, I don't think we're going to see a big fiscal boost, but 2024 is not going to be the year of fiscal tightening. You know, even in Europe, it's, it's you know, we've just had the announcement of the new fiscal rules, but it's highly unlikely that they will be really reinforced ahead of the European parliamentary elections. That probably will be more of a 2025 story, and then in Europe, it will depend on how much they use the next generation EU funds. Um, but I think also, um, when we're thinking about the impact on central banks and what it means for money, Monetary policy, it's other supply side impacts on the economy. You know, we've been talking about supply for the last few years um, and in many ways trade tensions and what the latest disruptions in the Red Sea mean and such like. But, but labour markets, there's supply constraints in labour markets demographically and to do with skills shortages. And that's why it's interesting in the European context. The European data has been pretty awful, particularly in Germany, but the hit to the supply side has been bigger than it has, for instance, in the US. Growth has been stronger, but there has been a bit more flexibility on the labour markets. So, so yes, you know, central banks, they're not looking just mechanically at what the Red Sea no, shipping no. costs mean. They're looking at what's happening on the demand side and the supply side, and is their monetary policy setting appropriate to yeah. ensure not just that inflation is heading back to 2%, but that it's going yeah. to remain there um, for some time. Who, who do you think will cut first? I mean, is it... We've got them both in the same month, <laughs> I'm afraid. Uh, so the, the ECB and the Fed, we've got the first rate cuts in June. And, and equally unexcitingly, perhaps, uh, for some, um, we've got the same magnitude of easing, 75 basis points for both by the end of 2024. What's your expectation for, for Bank of England? Actually, we've got the Bank of England um, a meeting later. Um, than the Fed and the ECB. In the near term, obviously, um, headline inflation in, in the UK could actually surprise. It could even dip below 2% on our projections just because some of these um, utility price increase uh, cuts and then increases. So as that January um, cut in utility prices feeds through, you could, uh, for a temporary period, get a dip in inflation. But, but on the Bank of England, it is more what we see as the supply side constraints um, in the economy. The activity has has been weak, but there have been some signs of reacceleration and stabilisation. Um, even some of the manufacturing data has been improving um, to some degree. So, um, yeah, uh, ju just a month later than the uh, uh, a meeting later than, than the Fed and the ECB. Uh, we caught up with, with the governor Andrew Bailey uh, yesterday, and he, he just would not say that you know the next move is a cut. 
And I don't know what he's so afraid of. Is there, I mean, is it communication style that's very different to ECB and, and Fed? Does, would that be helpful, actually, even for the transmission of, of monetary policy, giving more of a signal to markets? Well, I think part of the issue might be with the Bank of England. You know, we saw a three-way split. You know, there aren't many central banks in the world <laughs> where, certainly major central banks, where you get some voting for cuts, some for increases, even if the majority are voting for rates on hold. And any governor or chair of a central bank has to speak for the committee and not necessarily just speak with their, with their own voice. Um, but I think, broadly speaking, the messaging was the next move is a cut, um, but we don't want to move um, prematurely. Um, the activity data have not been, um, you know, disappointed necessarily, even if the inflation data have broadly been um, encouraging and they just want to see more evidence, they want to be more confident um, before they deliver that. Cut. But can they really actually take inflation down without hitting the labour market? Well, we are looking for some softening um, in the labour market um, in the UK, um, but you know, that's partly because of, you know, lagged effects of a slowdown in demand that's already happened. You know, it's a very different picture to the US, where second half growth was really, really strong and there's been that fundamental demand. This is, you know, part of the issue in the UK and in the Eurozone is that productivity growth has been a lot weaker, not least because investment spending in Europe has been a lot weaker than it has in the US. Um, so it is, um, it, it's a different picture. Um, but I think they just need to see the confidence on the inflation data. And as we well know, the wage figures, while the latest data has been a softening, the wage figures in the UK, the wage growth figures are a lot higher than they are um, even in the Eurozone and obviously a lot higher than they are in the UK. So so it's more about the wages yes. than the job numbers. As always, thank you, Janet. That was wonderful. Janet Henry, Global Chief Economist at HSBC. Now, we do have a couple, well, let's look at some of the stocks that could be on the move. Meta pre-market surging, actually, as fourth quarter earnings and revenue beat estimates. The social media giant posted a 25% gain in sales and profits that tripled while also projecting revenue growth for the current period that surpassed projections. And you can see pre-market gained some 17%. Now coming up, we'll be joined by Dr. Ilham Kadri, the chief executive of chemical maker Siensko. Well, we'll discuss the company's spin-off, growth outlook and much more. That's coming up shortly. And this is Bloomberg. Now, last year, chemical manufacturer Solvay joined a host of companies in Europe, increasingly turning to spin-offs instead of IPOs as a way of listing a unit. Well, that spin-off produced Siensko, a company making specialty chemicals used in the production of everything from airplanes and electric vehicles to mining and oil production. Well, I'm now joined by Ilam Kadri, the chief executive of Siensko. Dr. Ilam, thank you for joining. I mean, first of all, congratulations. You've been listed for about a month and a half. Yeah. And, and I know it's, you know you have a market cap of, of almost nine billion. So what does it mean for, for the future growth of Ciensco? Well, thank you for having me, Francine. Yeah, it's a big day. I mean, I will always remember December 11th, right, when we ranked the bell in Brussels. What does it mean? Well, actually, the split is bringing this new company, Science Co. Science, in its name, poised to grow the top line. We are aligned with the mega trend. You find us in every vehicle that flies in the air. You find us in one out of two EV vehicles while in your batteries. We are under the hood application. You find us in healthcare, in hemodialysis. 50% of the patients in the world are using our products. In resources efficiency is a big deal. Rare earths, metal purification, etc. And you find us in bio shampoo. If you use a Guar shampoo this morning under the shower, it's probably us. So 10 billion euro opportunities is waiting for us organically in the coming years. And so what will that growth actually look like? Are there parts of the market? Is is China is elsewhere where you can grow significantly? Oh. All over the regions, actually, 40% of our revenues are in Americas, 36% in Asia, and the rest is in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we like this balance because investors they like to de-risk yeah. such investments. So, and we are very, uh, we are global, but we are very regional. We do America and China for China, for America and for China. So we go very close to our customers. So yeah, I'm bullish about the U.S., about China, and. 
Europe has these challenges, but we're going to get there. I was going to say, I mean, you're a wonderful microcosm, actually, to try yeah. to understand yeah. really the world economy and what's doing well yeah. and not. Are you really optimistic about the U.S.? I mean, the, the economy is doing fantastic. Yeah, I mean, despite interest rates and the debts, etc., uh, the economy is doing really great. Forty percent of our revenues are in, in, in the U.S., the largest human capital. We are building one billion dollars, the largest investments we've ever mm -hmm. done in our history, and the history probably of batteries in the U.S. with a partner, Orbea, uh, and this will cater 5 million EV cars, right, at maturity, and we got the IRA, obviously, subsidies, which helps a bit, yeah. you know, to improve the returns and make it easier for us to decide, but definitely we are very bullish about uh, America. I mean, I, I know you have so uh, automotive and aerospace, automotive being yeah. like EVs is yeah. your number one and, yeah. and number two market. Yeah. Have you seen any slowdown because of these higher interest rates? What, what we've seen in automotive specifically is the destocking effect. That was the best word since Q4 2022. Uh, hopefully most of it is behind us, right? And it's true, post-pandemic, a lot of stock happened in the value chain. Uh, now, I mean, I, I, we believe that 50% of the fleet by 2030 latest will be either hybrid and EV. And we love it at Science Co. Because whenever you move from an internal combustion engine car mm -hmm. to a hybrid or EV car, you can double the penetration of our technologies. And that's why one of our largest growth uh, platform is in batteries. And the 10 billion is actually, it's one of those. But we have also thermoplastic composites. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you take uh, an aircraft to your favorite holidays, uh, vacation uh, destination, the aisle, uh, the motors, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever is not metallic is us. And the penetration is compo composite is extremely important. Mm -hmm. It gives lightweight and it makes sustainable aviation and then the other one is green hydrogen is the new oil by 2030 without us there is no electrolyzer or fuel sales for hydrogen and the last one is biomaterials and so out of those four what do you think I mean it feels like EV actually will be the biggest driver going absolutely. forward because the adoption rate is probably quicker than everything else absolutely and that's why we are building capacity in the US that's a billion dollar investment actually what we miss is the infrastructure because with, with no uh, electrical station ch charging station there will be no EV cars so we need governments and authorities to support us with the ecosystem but definitely the demand is there there are transplants from Koreans Chinese even in the US US and in Europe building gigafactories as we call them but gigafactories they cannot work without specialty materials and we are inside the battery we are under the hood application for light weighing so we are synonymous of clean mobility and does it matter I mean th there's a trend also a lot of the EV makers in China are actually doing much better than maybe some of um, the Western cars does it make a difference to you in, in terms of your supplies or can you actually go to both markets well China is going fast on many many angles yeah. uh, despite uh, slower GDP growth rate right uh, the largest fleet in the world EV fleet in the world is in China, right? And we produce, you know, high-end, we are not yeah. in the commodities, high-end materials for yeah. Chinese electrification, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, there will be competition and fierce one, not only on the materials, but also yeah. on exported automobiles, right? Yeah. And EV and hybrid cars. So that's why governments, there is a moment of truth now on building the right policies, right? including on protecting the domestic production, yeah. local manufacturing, European and US, and also protecting IP, specifically that yes. Europe, for example, is demanding more green production, right? Um, what's your biggest challenge in the next 12 months? I don't know if there's any concerns about the supply chain or actually some of the materials that you need if they're hard to find. But if you look at the year ahead, or do you have two, three priorities that will be more difficult than others? Well, uh, f frankly, uh, I, I tend not to worry a lot about the macros because I can do nothing about them but just anticipate them. So it's another year, right? Let's see. And I'm in a quiet period. I cannot give you much on, on the guidance or forecast. But it's another year with its challenges. Yes, yeah, supply chain is a bit mm -hmm. challenged. We, we, we see it easing up, so it's not like uh, the gas crisis uh, uh, during the Ukrainian war or the COVID type of syndrome. Um, no, I mean, the focus for us is to focus on our customers and get mm -hmm. this uh, startup, but it's 8 billion euro company yes. with 13,200 <laughs> up and running and, uh, you know, really poised to innovate, mm -hmm. to grow uh, with capital discipline. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Ilham Kadri. There, Thank I think you. this is the first of many, many interviews because you, have, hope you so. <laughs> have a great understanding of the world economy and where it's going. That was the chief executive of Sciensco. Now, much more to come. This is Bloomberg.
overall, Meta is surging as fourth quarter earnings and revenue beat estimates. The social media giant posted a 25% gain in sales and profits that actually tripled, while also projecting revenue growth for the current period that surpassed projections. And Amazon reporting strong sales. They also gave an operating income outlook that surpassed estimates. You can see Amazon pre-market gained 6.2%. Uh, Meta is actually 16.3% higher pre-market. And then Apple reporting a deepening slump in China during the holiday quarter, even as total iPhone sales were stronger than expected and the company returned to revenue growth. Coming up, it's here, U.S. Jobs Day. We discuss all of this with the ADP chief economist, Nella Richardson. Uh, we talk productivity. Of course, we talk wage growth and everything else. This is Bloomberg. Meta and Amazon surge pre-market as cost-cutting pays off. Investors punish Apple as sales slump in China. U.S. Jobs Day is here. Non-farm payrolls are expected to show a slower pace of hiring with revisions to past reports key to the Fed's outlook. Plus, the Bank of England opens the door to rate cuts for the first time this cycle. We'll bring you our interview with the governor, Andrew Bailey. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, today's monthly U.S. jobs report will probably show a slower pace of hiring in 2023 following annual revisions. That's the view of Bloomberg Economics. Meanwhile, initial and recurring applications for U.S. and unemployment benefits both rose to a two-month high. Well, joining us now is ADP Chief Economist Nella Richardson. Now, it's so good to see you, and, and on a, actually always a big U.S. jobs day. What are you looking out for today? Well, I want to see, first of all, it's great to see you. And look, three things, really. I want to see that the unemployment rate stays below 4%. That's almost a foregone yeah. conclusion. I want to see if the labor force participation rate holds or goes up. And of course, the third piece is wages. How quickly are they moderating? Are they moderating at all? And can we can think that this moderation continues through the year? So if they moderate, does that automatically actually lead to, to a harder jobs market? It, does it weaken the whole, the whole sector? It right. softens the jobs market. Mm -hmm. I still think that the labor market is pretty tight. Uh, we released at ADP jobs numbers on Wednesday, 107,000 private mm -hmm. sector job gains. In a normal economy, that would be a good number. In this economy, that's a slowdown. And so it, context is really important. Uh, for the BLS number in a few hours, the expectation mm -hmm. is about 180,000 jobs. Mm -hmm. I would regard that as still strong, even though it's slowing. So who's creating jobs? Is it the small and again, it, it's actually, you know, the devil's in the detail, as mm -hmm. they always say. Like, where are you seeing the, the best jobs growth? Interestingly, it's been in healthcare. Now, maybe not so interestingly, this is not a cyclical uh, industry. It's not as vulnerable to interest rates like manufacturing, where we've seen losses and weakness. And so we've seen steady gains in that sector in the BLS report. I think that continues, but I don't know what the runway is. I don't think it's going to be the leader all the way through 2024. In 2023, we had leisure and hospitality. It was the stalwart, steady job gains. I don't think it's going to be the leader this year. I think that it's maxed out some of that potential to lead. So there's no clear forefront in the labor market. And I guess that is a place where there's a little concern yeah. about slowness in all of this, all of these solid numbers. Is it quality jobs that it's creating? I mean, are, are people staying in the jobs? Because again, sometimes we look at the top line growth and we say, okay, everything's fine. But, but is it jobs that people want or, that, or is it jobs they need? It looks like it's more part-time jobs okay. in this cycle, um, that the hiring has been for part-time. And for women, it's really interesting. We saw that w for prime age women, labor market participation hit a record level over the summer. But what we see in our data is more women are working, but they're working less hourly. Women are working fewer hours now than they did before the crisis. So I think that's a watch point, um, whether or not these are 
full-time jobs or are they part-time jobs and whether or not workers want part-time yeah. or they actually really want full-time and can't find the work. Um, you know, when you speak to investors, a lot of them say, look, it's quite difficult to look at or to know what data points to look at. Mm -hmm. has, has your job uh, you know, changed in the research that you do? So I, you know, job offerings now are a lot on LinkedIn. There's a lot of technology. Is that useful? I look at wages. Wages are the bridge between the labor market and inflation. And we track wages on an individual way. So it doesn't matter what the cohort is. We just track one worker to themselves. And what we've seen is for the job stayers who've been on the job for 12 months or more and job switchers, the premium of changing a job has shrunk from over 7% this time last year yeah. to less than 2%. There's not a lot of gains on average from switching. And you see that in the quits numbers from Jolts and the BLS. People aren't changing jobs as much. There's much more stability in the labor market, maybe more productivity too, yeah. because all that switching is unstable for teams. It's harder to be productive when you have people coming in and out like that. But is this an outlaw or is this also at the forefront then of people looking for less jobs? Because if you're desperate for workers and you're willing to pay 8% more. I think that's one narrative that people are not looking as hard. Yeah. I would counter with another narrative. Yeah. They're not getting offers. Um, maybe people are looking for those opportunities still. They are thinking that they're in the 22 yeah. market and companies are just being more selective in their hiring. So what we've seen is that we're, we haven't seen a pickup in layoffs yeah. or severance. Even with these latest numbers, it's still below the pre-crisis mm -hmm. average. But mm -hmm. firms aren't hiring as aggressively. And so those offers may not com be coming in. It may not be a worker's mm -hmm. choice not to look. I mean, one of the other things we've been trying to figure out is actually, I mean, it's incredible that interest rates have gone up so much and it hasn't actually hit the health of companies. And this could be, you know, they cast ourselves back to COVID and say, well, I can't lose my workers because then it's so tough to, to fire them. I mean, is there a COVID kind of still lag of how people hire and fire employees? Absolutely. I think the imprint of COVID will be with us for a while. That's important. But I also think there are structural changes in the labor market that we're looking at as cyclical, yeah. but they're actually longer term. And healthcare is one of those places. The care economy, there's a lot of shortages. Young people are not going into the care economy. There's much more demand to be met. And I think that's going to be consistent whether whatever the macro drivers are, people still are going to need nurses. So um, that's been really important. And in a lot of reports where you look at AI and the impact on jobs, I mean, this is the one thing that comes up. Have you started actually trying to do a blueprint of what significant AI changes mean for the job market and job losses? I don't know who has it. <laughs> <laughs> It's true, but also but we don't really know what AI becomes at this point, right? Right. So what we're looking at it is a part of the skills ontology, and it really syncs up with what companies, large companies, have okay. been doing with skill-based hiring. Maybe not hiring because they have a university degree, but they have skills and can be trained, and that's to address these labor shortages they've seen in pockets of the labor market. If you look at AI at the skill level or the task level, it could really be helpful for companies in uh, finding those tasks that they can't find in the workforce or that skill level. So there, it remains to be seen the overall effect. I don't think anyone has a handle on it yet, but we're watching it closely. Yeah, so it's not like, you know, 40 million jobs are lost within the first like in the next five years or so we've seen some crazy numbers too right i don't think anyone's <laughs> going to come out in their earnings statement <laughs> and say because of gen i we reduced costs by this much and we laid off this many i don't think we're at that point yeah. fast forward a decade from now maybe yeah. you'll see that but right now companies are looking at this as an augmentation a productivity enhancer and i think that there's a, some benefit in that so i could talk jobs all day with you but d d how much is the fed looking at jobs compared to other metrics again they have they have a tough job because last year we thought there was no landing soft landing hard landing and so the how they actually measure the economy seems to be changing in my view i think that the federal reserve is looking for a reason to cut and they can't find one um, that's what I read from the press conference. I know that's not what was said by Chair Powell. That's what I read into it. Because if you look at all the data, 3.1 percent growth in 2023, 3.3 uh, in the fourth quarter, 4.9 in the, in the third quarter, unemployment below uh, uh, 4 percent, layoffs still very low for historical averages. What's the reason to cut? I know Wall Street <laughs> wants it. Probably the Fed would like to start to ease back on, on all the tightness. But there's nothing in the economy economy flashing yellow to address and so they just have to wait for the reason um, before they can land this plane.
No, thank you so much for joining me today. That was, of course, the ADP Chief Economist, Nell Richardson, and on Jobs Day. So we'll be watching jobs very, very closely today for the U.S. Now, coming up, the Bank of England has opened the door to interest rate cuts, slashing its outlook for inflation this year. My interview with the governor, Andrew Bailey, next. And this is Bloomberg. Change the question really from how restrictive do we need to be to for how long do we need to be restrictive? That's important. We've also taken the upside bias off. We have included a risk, by the way, a new risk actually, which is we're really reflecting obviously sort of tragic events in the Middle East and the impact that can have through the, the Red Sea effects. Um, so I think now the question is for us is really is for how long do we need to maintain this stance going forwards? As I, you know, I've said a number of times, we're not going. You know, we're not making predictions at this point. Um, we're, we're setting up the framework. The things that we think are important to look at really haven't changed, actually. So, services, inflation, aspects of the labour market, you know, the domestic drivers of inflation, because these global shocks. I think you know, we're now seeing the disinflation side of the global shocks. But Governor, is there a, a specific? Is it wage growth? Is there something specific in the set of numbers that you look at that will give you the impetus to cut? Well, I think a number of things. I mean, services inflation, I mean, it's still at 6.4%, so it's still you know, well above anything that you know, I would say is consistent with us consistently meeting the target, first of all. I think with wage growth, we have seen the official measure come down. It's below where we thought it would be. Open question, really, as to whether that was a sort of bit of an adjustment of some anomalies in that index or whether that really is you know, a, a, a move. But it doesn't, it's now in line with the other things we look at. Again, you know, they're above, frankly, levels that are consistent with, with hitting the target. But I think the important thing there is to say, look, you know, inflation has come down a long way, headline inflation. I would expect, and it's going, we think it's going to come down further in the short term. Is that thanks to the Bank of England policy? Well, I think, well, Two things there. First of all, I think the, ma it, it, the major driver of that is the disinflation side of the global shocks. What Bank of England policy has done, and I've been saying this some time, I think, is to prevent it becoming domestically embedded, tend to call the second round effects. That's what, and, and we always said that's what we can do. We can't stop global shocks. You know, I wish, obviously, we all wish we could stop wars, but we can't in that sense through monetary policy. So you know, our job is to stop it becoming embedded. Uh, Governor, so Jay Powell yesterday pushed back against expectations for a March rate cut. Markets are pricing in some kind of cut in May or June. Is that fair? Well, I think markets, I, th I think, are responding to the fact, again, that we have been, yeah, we've now set out, in a sense, our framework and said, you know, if the question for us is for how long, I think markets are coming up with their own answer to that, which, of course, they will, and that's quite reasonable. Our forecast, of course, is conditioned on their view, but it's not our only judgment, and we will decide now meeting by meeting. Uh, Governor, why are you so afraid of actually committing to a cut n next time? Is it because you're worried about inflation coming back? Or are you worried about you know, the budget um, that, that's coming up in March, or are you worried about having to reverse course? Well, there are really two reasons, actually. One is that was the evidence. We, we always want to see the evidence, and you know, the world is, and the second is the world is a, still a fairly uncertain place. There are you know, still things going on in the world which you know, I would say are not the normal course of events in the world and can have quite big effects. And so we want to see how these, you know, how these influence, you know, the, you know the, the, the evidence that is vital to us. Like an insurance policy. It, 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 it's a question really of being too soon to conclude that we're on that sustained path uh, to target. But I hope we'll be there, you know, do you think that the, the UK was in a recession in, in the last couple of months of 2023? Well, we don't have a recession in the forecast we've published today. Frankly, it's, it's in the balance, I think, you know, because you, know, you, you can have small margins either way. Um, we don't actually have a recession. And I think I, I would just emphasize perhaps a point that's even more important. I think there are clear signs with the indicators in the UK that we've seen some pickup in indicators really around the turn of the year and going through January. So, you know, I think that's a positive signal, and that's why it helps to explain why in our projections, our forecast, 
we've actually got a gradual pickup in growth. But, but it's, it's quite difficult to explain to someone who, who needs to decide whether to remortgage or not, given everything seems to be really hanging on a balance. How would you describe the economy? Well, I think we are seeing still subdued growth, but we're seeing some signs of a pickup in activity. I think we've seen we actually stronger, and I'm pleased about this, than we expected, household real incomes. Unemployment has not risen as, as we thought it would. That's good news, obviously, as well. Uh, and those things are you know, now being reflected through into what we see as a, a gradual pickup in economic activity uh, going forwards. Well, that was Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey speaking to me after yesterday's rate decision. Now, the head of the European Commission also met with farmers' unions in Brussels after a day of protests outside the European Parliament. Now, speaking after the meeting, Ursula von der Leyen appealed for joint solutions. We share the goals, for example, the protection of nature, because we all live in nature and with nature, and the best ambassadors for nature are the farmers themselves. Um, and important is for us that we find common solutions how to reach the goal, for example, to protect the environment and nature. Now, we're joined from Brussels by our Europe correspondent, Maria Tadeo, who's been following that story. So, Maria, first of all, why are farmers protesting? Uh, well, Francine, it's a very good question, and there isn't a single uh, answer. It's a constellation of issues. When you talk to uh, farmers in Europe, they point to what they say is unfair competition, bad practices. Uh, they also say that there is too much regulation and even uh, the climate action. What they argue is that a lot of the greener policies that the European Union is pursuing means it becomes more expensive to do their business, and they do not get the price tag, the premium that products like that should have if you spend more money to uh, be in green that should be reflected too in the margins and the revenue they get they say for the time being uh, it's not enough so you do see a constellation of issues for farmers immediately yesterday the head of the commission uh, took a meeting with a number of unions obviously we know yesterday was heated uh, on the streets of Brussels you see it behind me this is the day after the cleanup today we've seen the entire morning at teams here to clean up uh, the mess you've seen behind me a statue too with a burnt uh, head uh, you also see the sign of down with uh, despots unclear who those are. You'd assume uh, the idea of bureaucrats uh, in Brussels was top of mind. But again, it was very interesting yesterday to see the head of the commission immediately uh, reacting, going to see farmers, saying she wants to listen. And of course, all of that we need to see in the context of the European elections. The last thing uh, European officials want to see is a form of protest that becomes entrenched, almost like the yellow vest. So that was uh, a quick response already from the head of the commission, saying uh, she listens, she understands, and there will be measures taken, although it's unclear uh, whether they'll uh, be able to appease uh, some of the protests and some of the anger that we've seen play out in the past 24 hours. Maria, as always, some great reporting there on the ground. Our Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Coming up, U.S. regional banks extend their sell-off on commercial property fears. We discuss that next, and this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. So New York Community Bank Corp tumbled for a second straight day as Wall Street downgrades piled up and Moody's Investor Service actually put the lender on review for a credit rating cut. Well, joining us now is Bloomberg's Sridhar Natarajan, of course, our star reporter covering Wall Street. We're lucky enough to have him in London this week. So, Sri, is this another regional banking crisis in the U.S.? I want to be brave enough and stick my neck out and say no. And I'll tell you why. This is not the first regional bank to report during this earnings cycle. We've had a slew of reports which were pretty uneventful and that's how we like it. So this was the first big one where there was a problem. However, the big worry with these things is when you have a stock that's down 40% one day, another 10% the next day, has lost half its value, it shakes confidence in the market and the risk is this can become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that's when we start worrying about the broader issues. So far, the issues tied to New York Community Bank are tied to a bigger problem in the market, the commercial real estate market, that has hurt them in a very specific and particular manner. And there is another unique factor that is affecting this bank, the fact that it is a bit of a bigger bank. Funny reason, through the last regional banking tumult we had in the U.S., which was less than a year ago, NYCB was one of the winners. It managed to pick off a part of Signature Bank 
a really good deal. They got it for a song from the regulators. Their stock doubled. Now it's trading less than the levels it was at last March, and that's why everyone's concerned. But, uh, Sri, what are you worried about? So if this is a trigger, and it's a little bit bigger than some of the other ones, is it the even smaller banks that are actually at risk here? The numbers are important. So what is driving the problems at NYCB? We're talking about the increase in reserves in a way that the market did not expect. A big jump in the net charge-offs, another big jump in the cash that they had to stockpile for the loans on their balance sheet. That is because of the problems in the real estate market in the U.S., the office real estate market. The numbers that back this, by the end of next year, you will have $560 billion of maturities. At a time when the market's been rocked, office values have been sliding, and there are bigger factors behind this. The pandemic obviously jolted that market. You have a rapid zoom up in rates. You still don't have office occupancy to the levels that people would like, and everyone is rethinking their office footprint. What that means, unfortunately, is kind of what we saw in Los Angeles recently, where a building had to sell at almost half the value of what it was marked at yeah. in 2014, 10 years ago. That's not the direction you like. And when it comes to the office real estate market, it really does affect the regional yeah. banks because almost 30%, 29% of the assets on their balance sheet yeah. are these real estate loans. That's not the case with the bigger banks. And that's why but, we're a touch concerned about the exposure of the real estate yeah. market, the CRE market, and the regional banks. But do, do we know exactly where it is? Because this, I mean, the concern, we've been speaking about commercial real estate and the fact that something ugly could happen for, frankly, quite some time. So as long as we know the exposure, then as an analyst or a reporter, you know where you're looking. The problem is that if you don't. And, and that's part of the challenge. You don't really know which landlord would look at what's happening with their loans, their challenge with refinancing their loans and just simply choose to walk away. Some others will try and find some other options. And it becomes a bit of a game of whack-a-mole. You think you have it contained one yes. area and then suddenly it comes somewhere else. With New York Community Bank, it really was two big loans that they specifically flagged as the problem case yeah. here. When it's just two loans that can drive such a big, uh, let's call it, lack of confidence in the market, then it's really hard to figure out where the next problem would come. You hope it's contained. You hope everyone is conservatively marking these loans are appropriately reserved. But when you have a case like this, it does make you want to kick the tires and see where else the problems exist. But so are you worried about some of the big, big banks or would they have taken precaution in making sure that their exposure is handled? As much as I use, hate to use a tired cliche, I still have to say it's unfortunately the, the reality is it is the tale of two cities. The big banks with respect to their CRE exposure, it is just 6.5%. That's 6.5% relative to 29%. Not nothing, but it is not almost a third of the assets on your balance sheet. So I am not that concern that the big banks will get hit that much? Like, if the big banks are getting whacked by it, you're, you're, you've got a much bigger yeah. problem with the slew yeah. of the smaller banks that you have in the U.S. As always, thank you so much. We'll have to get you back on to also talk about some of the other big trends, of course, on Wall Street, Sridhar Natarajan there. Now, Meta surging pre-market. This is after fourth quarter earnings and revenue beat estimates. In fact, um, the giant posted 25% gain in sales profits that tripled. They were also projecting revenue growth for the current period that surpassed projections. Well, that's it for The Pulse. Bloomberg Brief with Manus Krani up next.